do not have a Bible, please raise your hand. You want a Bible in hand as we're going to go through verses 9 through 16. So you want to see what God says. Um, so we got a couple hands up. Romans chapter 12, we're going to be picking it up in verse 9. Before we get into our Bible study, with Bibles in hand and open, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to bless our study. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name we come to you this morning. So grateful for your love and so grateful for your mercy, acknowledging that it is a fresh and it's new. It's new right now. It's new every morning. And Lord, one thing we would ask and one thing that we desire is that through your word, your love would abound from our lives. We ask, Lord, that love would abound, that it would abound towards one another, that it would abound towards a dying and dark world. So, Lord, we ask that you would plug us in, that we might bring light into this world. Amen. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes, that we would see you in your word. Lord, let our minds be attentive and our hearts, our hearts soft and pliable. Lord, let us be Play-Doh in your hands, that you would make us into the men and women of God that you desire us to be. So bless your word, bless our Bible study, we ask now in Jesus' name. And all who agreed said, Amen. Amen. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. <laughs> Gonna find out who's naughty and nice. Well, that's Santa Claus, of course. But God has made a list also. He didn't have to check it twice. And if we follow this list, we will not only know God's will, we will fulfill God's plan for our lives. A list? That sounds awful legalistic there, Pastor. <laughs> Listen, we all have lists that we live by. To-do lists. You go to work and there's that list. Oh, yeah, I didn't get to that yesterday. We're going to kick off the day with yesterday's stuff before we get into today's stuff. I got a list. <laughs> we all have lists, guys. They're called honey-do lists. I brought mine from my wife. I better get busy, do you think? <laughs> we have lists, honey lists, grocery lists, bucket lists. And every list has attached to it expectations. You know, if you complete this list, if I complete my honey-do list, <laughs> my marriage will be good. Not that it's bad, but if you don't, well, there's consequences to it. Consequences are attached to every list. Consequences vary. You give your children chores, a list of chores. Take out the trash, clean your room, make your bed, shower once in a while. <laughs> if not, there, well, there's consequences. And you know what? God has a list and attached to his list are God's expectations and what His children should look like. What His children should look like, not, not physically, because we kind of blow that, because He's got a new body for us, but spiritually, who we should look like, what we should be spiritually, and how we should act. Why? Well, because the world expects Christians to be different. They expect you to be different. They expect you to live out words, words like honor, Amen. honesty, Amen. diligence, hospitality, compassion, mercy, grace. They expect you to be that and live that. Amen. Everyone has expectations. Every list has expectations attached to it. Expectations. Yeah, you, you expect me to 
you fill in the blank. You have expectations for me. Don't lie, you know you do. You expect me to be a specific way. Your spouse has expectations of you to... You expect God to... Oh, I don't... No, yes you do. You have expectations with God. God, this is my prayer. I expect you to answer it in the way I want you to answer it. <laughs> we expect God to. But the world... The world and God has expectations of Christians. And it's right here in Romans chapter 12, picking up our verse-by-verse -verse study. Let's all look at verse 9 as we read, Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoice in hope, patience in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Deep breath. <gasps> Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Amen. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. And in doing so, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. Do not overcome evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what's expected of you. <laughs> and you did it all, right? And God, as we do these things, will, will bring forth fruit. See, God's will in respect to spiritual fruit, you have to first understand the principle is love. It's love. See, love should always be the motivation for everything we do. And when using spiritual gifts, and spiritual gifts should be a natural flow from love. You don't use spiritual gifts to make love. It's because of God's love abounding and flowing through you, spiritual gifts abound. It's, it's just a natural thing. Love brings forth the spiritual gifts, not the other way around. And here the Apostle Paul gives us a list of what love should look like towards each other. He, he's speaking to the church. Brethren, he's saying, you, believers, this is what your love should look like. Now the first thing we need to understand is that there are four words in the ancient Greek that describe love. See, unlike English, unlike the English, we, you know, we basically have one word, love. Love is love. And so with one sentence I can say, I love my wife dearly and I love Cheetos. Puffs, not crunchies, puffs. <laughs> and it's the same thing. It's the same word. But in the Greek, in the ancient Greek, there are four words because the language is so precise, God needs to describe exactly what our love should be. Now the first word, and it's up on the board, you'll see is eros. Eros comes from the primordial Greek god of sex and beauty. Sex and beauty. It is the essence of erotic love. Eros is where we get the word erotic from. It is literally Eros means to grasp or to grab. And that's the picture of when a husband and wife come together and they consummate. So you're grasping, you're grabbing. And it's the essence of erotic love because it is to gratify desire. The second word is phile or philo, philo. And this is where brotherly love comes from. It's where we get the word Philadelphia, phila. And, and it's a fondness, it's a warm regard for one person, but it is a selective 
love. You select to do this. This is a picture of Jonathan and David in the Old Testament, how they loved each other. They were like brothers. Beautiful picture. The next word is storgo, or storge, storgos. And this is family love. This is family love. This is a devotion that a family should have one towards another. There should be a, a, a love towards each other. It should be natural. It shouldn't be contrived. It should just happen. And it should be a devotion. It's a devoted love. And the final word is agape or agapo. Now agape love is used 252 times in the New Testament. It was barely used in the writings of the ancient Greeks like Plato and, and all the others, so much so that a lot of these guys back in the day, they said this was a word that the apostles made up to describe a supernatural love, that they made up the word and it's only mostly in the Bible. But what this love is, this love is sacrificial love, completely sacrificial love. It is unrequainted. In other words, it loves without wanting anything back. It just loves. In spite of everything else, it loves. It loves. You, it, it, you love. It's the exact opposite of eros love. See, eros is self-gratifying. Agape, it considers others sacrificially. And agape love is the love that the Bible uses to describe God's love towards mankind, towards you. That no matter what you do, God loves you. And there's a cat with a hat. Get on a little rhyming thing there. But God loves you. It's His love towards you. He won't necessarily like what you're doing, but He always loves you. He always loves you. And so from the beginning of verse 9 of Romans chapter 12, Paul gives us descriptions, very descript, descript descriptions of what agape looks like in the church. Look at verse 9 again. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. In honoring, give preference to one another. Love. Love. And, and you know what? Our love and the church should be without hypocrisy, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it be without hypocrisy? Isn't that what you expect? It, when, you, when you want to be in the presence of, of God and God's children, don't you expect it to be transparent, to be real, to be pure? Not hypocrisy. Well, they said this to me, but then they said that to them. I, I thought they cared. Write that, that word hypocrisy, circle it right next to it, actor or masked. There it is. See, this was a word they used in the ancient Greek to describe what actors and actresses would do. And back in those days, there was no such thing as actresses. Actors played the parts of girls by changing a mask. And, and in the church, Paul is saying, let your love in the church be without having to change your mask. Church isn't supposed to be theater. It's not supposed to be theater. It's supposed to be pure. It's supposed to be real. But when you go to a lot of churches nowadays, doesn't it feel like you're in a theater? It's like sometimes it's like a Broadway show. It's like, look at the stage and the lights and, hey, the best band money could buy. Are they saved? They're not? Wow. Really? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. The idea that Paul is trying to convey is the church and Christian love should be genuine and sincere and transparent. That means God's will for all believers is to have a pure love, a love without a mask. And the perfect example of someone whose love was wearing a mask, Judas. Judas. Jesus, I love you. Oh, it was a lie. Remember when, when the alabaster box was opened up over him, over Jesus and anointing him? And, and what did Judas say? Lord, Lord, what a waste of money. That, money. that should have been given to the poor. 
No, he didn't want the, he wasn't going to give the money to the poor. He hauled the money back. He was going to steal it. Hypocrisy. Christian love should be pure, without a mask. Not to gain, but to give. That, that's what love does. It gives. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, so many times we give because we want back. Here, I'll give you gifts. <laughs> Nothing back. <laughs> oh, man. No, it's to give. And we have the greatest gift of all to give people. We have life. We have Jesus Christ. We can give life to people. We can give pure love to people. Hey, I got a gift for you. I got life for you. I got light for you. Light that's going to shine in the darkness, that's going to illuminate your situation and change it. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can do that. But to have a pure love, to love giving without gaining, we look at the second half of that verse, verse 9 there. Abhor what is evil. Abhor what is evil. Circle that word abhor and right above it, next to it, alongside of it, hate strongly. Hate strongly. And that's what the Christian is supposed to do. Hate evil strongly. Abhor it. Now, you don't hate evil according to the world standards. You, you See, we have a standard in pores right here. And this tells us exactly what we're to hate. Did you know that hate is a characteristic of God? God hates things. He doesn't, you know, God loves you. He loves you. God hates sin, loves the sinner. Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't get that. Listen, sometimes we do things that God doesn't like, but it doesn't change his love towards you. He loves you. He loves you. He doesn't always like the things you do. In fact, sometimes you do things. He goes, I, I'm hating that. <laughs> hating that. And then he brings conviction, and conviction is to change. Amen. So we're to hate according to his standards, not the world standards. Why? Well, because the world standard is always changing, isn't it? I mean, what was considered evil 50 years ago is like, ah, no big deal now. <laughs> hey, it's legal. Let's do it. All right. Well, that's not what God's Word says. It never changes. It has never changed. God's like going, oh, you know, things have changed. Let's change that. This is okay now. No, because we don't change, and He knows the results of doing specific things. God is unchanging. He doesn't change. There's no variance in Him. And then He tells us in the same breath, in that same breath, He says, cling to what is good. Hate strongly what is evil, but cling to what is good. I find it interesting that God gives us a commandment to love and hate in the same thought, in the same breath. It's, it's almost like, oh, I'm torn now. What do I do? I hate what is evil, but I cling to what is good. I cling to what is good. Because if I'm clinging to what is good, I'm clinging to Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, this word cling, if you want to circle it and write above it, it actually means to entwine. It, it, it's literally to be in unity, to unite. And, and it's, it's funny because God tells us that He hates sin and He tells us what He loves. And so He's saying, cling, entwine yourself around that which is good. And this is the things, this is the words of Jesus. This is what He teaches. You guys remember in Revelation, for those of you that have been with us for a while, chapter 2, verse 20, Jesus is speaking to the church at Thyatira. The church of Thyatira. And he tells them, because you have allowed that harlot Jezebel to teach, and literally what she was teaching was, you know, to sum it up, softness and sin. Softness and sin. It, you know, adultery is okay and fornication is okay. It, it, it's okay to do these things. That's what she's teaching. And this is what Jesus says. He basically says, listen, unless you repent, you will be cast into a sickbed and or the great tribulation. See, God has never been soft on sin, but His mercies are new and afresh every day. His grace is sufficient for all things. And so the Apostle Paul rebukes the Corinthians because of immorality. He rebukes the Galatians because of legalism. And he's telling us here, look at yourself. Take a look. 
Take a look at yourself. How do we respond to that which God hates? And how do we respond to that which God loves? And those are the things we're supposed to cling to. See, again, cling is to entwine, to attach yourself to something, to be united with something. And if you've ever had, anybody ever had ivy? You know, if you've got to, got to watch or else it takes over everything. All around the poles it entwines itself. And, and there's a lot of houses that have had this was true with my parents' house. They had ivy literally for 30 years on their house. And when they went to tear it off to paint the house, there were like parts of wood that just crumbled. Wow. It was just dead rot. It was rotted. Yeah. And, and so a lot of times, you know, <laughs> that's what's holding up the structure. <laughs> Clinging to what is good can hold you up, can lift you up, can lift you out of dark places. Secondly, Paul's us that, Paul tells us that our love should have compassion. Compassion. Look at verse 10. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. Now this word affection, you can circle it and write devoted. He's saying be devoted. Be devoted in brotherly love. Or a better translation would actually be have family affection with brotherly love. Why? Because God's eyes, the church as a family. That's how he sees it. He says, this is a family. Be devoted. Don't be devoted to a building. Be devoted to the body, the body of Christ. And, and because he views it as a family, and, and a lot of times for a lot of people, the church is more of a family than our blood is. When I first came to Christ, being Jewish, you know, basically I was ostracized. Oh, there's David again. I'll get, you know, and it's like I clung to the church family. It was my family. That's what I had. Now, by the grace of God, my mom came to know Christ and my dad started softening up. He's still not saved. But even with my brother and sister, there's not that great of relationship because they don't agree with who I am. You know, my brother will call me, um, he's had terminal cancer for a while, and he go, man, I really wish I had what you had. I really wish I had a family. I really wish that, I said, man, Jesus will give that to you. He gave it to me. He'll give it to you. I don't want to hear this Jesus stuff. Oh. <laughs> and it's like, you know, love you too, bro. <laughs> you know, it's like, but that's his attitude about Jesus. I mean, he'll talk about God, but you mention the name of Jesus, he doesn't want anything to do with that. One of the things I love about coming to church here, and you can give yourselves a pat on the back, is there's genuine love here. I mean, there really is genuine love. And it's not just for one another. It's for the stranger coming off the street. A lot of times someone will pull me off the side and I'll see someone new come in and, and five, six, seven people, will, hey, hey, nice to meet you. God bless you. Victor, who's hunting or something, if he's, he'll give you a big bear hug, and it's like, hey, you know, it's like family. It's like, wow, I'm loved. And it's not you, it's Christ in you. Hallelujah. I love that. I love that. It's awesome to watch. I, it's awesome to come in and watch worship when people are worshiping the Lord, loving on the Lord. And it's almost like the, the worship team's transparent. And it's not you, it's you're worshiping the Lord. You're worshiping the Lord. I love that. I love that. So he goes on and says, and did you see at the end of verse 10, in honoring, giving preference one to another. Shouldn't the ch church, shouldn't a Christian be honorable? Shouldn't we be honorable? I mean, when you think of a Christian, you know, you think, hey, they're honorable. They're honor what is honorable? Well, if you circle that word, you can write next to it, the Greek language, and you have to understand, write tima, and it means value or prize something. In other words, you honor something, you value it, you see, you see it's a prize, and it comes from the root word, which literally means to pay a price. Something that's of value is worth paying a price. You know, it's like, you know, you see a brand new car. The other day I was out here on Wednesday and somebody, there was a beautiful, beautiful, brand new Lamborghini. I was in coveting land right there. I was looking at that going, oh. 
but it's beautiful and there's value in that. And I'm thinking, wow, what I could do with all that money? <laughs> Guy hopped in it and off, off he drove. And I'm thinking, wow, but he valued that. I mean, he walked out and it's like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, he, he paid a price too. He paid a price for that. And you recognize where there is value and you give value to that. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, we read, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. This word in, in the ancient Hebrew is where you actually get the word for honor in the New Testament. And that word, it, it's, it's translated as kabod. Kabod. And kabod literally translates glory. It's a word used constantly throughout the Old Testament for the glory of God. It, it's a description of God. Glory. And the implication is you recognize a weight. You know, when you think about God, you think there's weight there. There's substance there. There's something worthy of glory. Worthy of glory. And you esteem it. You esteem it. So God is declaring value here in the parent. He's saying, hey, children, recognize that in your parent is value. Amen. And you should recognize that. Why? Well, because when a parent, when the parents say yes to having children, they're saying no to almost everything else. <laughs> Think about it. When you say yes to kids, you're saying no to a two or three time vacation at faraway places. You're saying no to a new car every three years. You're saying no to new clothes all the time. You're saying no. Why? Because you're saying yes to children. And saying yes to children means a lifetime of worry, terror, gray hair, no hair, <laughs> no sleep. Some of you guys are going, yeah. no sleep. And if you're a mom, Moms, let me just say right in here and now, thank you. Thank you, moms. Thank you. Why moms, not dads? Because moms had you inside of you. She said yes, and, and, and there was a living, growing being inside of her. And having a living, growing being inside of her, you know, messes up the body an awful lot. Causes a lot of damage. That's a decision that a mom makes. It causes tremendous damage to their body. For when the mom says yes to having a baby, she also said yes to stretch marks, wrinkles, weight gain, <laughs> chemical changes within the body, and <laughs> pain, pain, unbearable pain. If it was up to guys to have kids, <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> we're done because we're wimps. We're wimps. Some of you guys know it. You're admitting, you're going, yeah. Because, you know, when I'm sick, I got a sniff. I got a sniffle. I can't. Really? Mom's got a cold. I mean, literally 106 degree temperature. She's got a baby here. She's got the pot here. She's got the phone here. She's getting the door here. <laughs> my sons and my daughters don't understand the damage they did to my wife. And, you know, to be honest with you, I'm surprised that after each one was born, I didn't give them a spanking. Do you know what you did to your mother? Look, she's over there crying. Get over here. You're grounded for life. <laughs> Incredible damage to the human body. And I know some of you are thinking, well, Pastor, not my parents. You don't know. My parents were horrible parents. But honestly, is there a perfect parent ever? No. No. See, there's, there's enough of that to go around. And, and here's the thing is, God has a list. God has a book. And if we follow this, if, if we do what this is telling us to do, well, guess what? God has a way of transforming things. That's, that's his business. He transforms people. He can transform a bad parent into a good parent. He can transform a bad husband into a good husband, a bad wife into a good wife. 
Psychiatry can't do it. I can't do it. Jesus Christ will do it. He's the only one who can. He's the only one who can. So God's word, as we yield to it, does incredible things. So we must honor. He's saying honor. Be honorable. Giving preference one to another. You know what that means? That means exactly what Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Take a look at it. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Amen. See, that's giving, in, that's giving honor to somebody. Hey, you know, here, you go first. You know, car, go ahead, go ahead. Hurry up. They're honking. Come on. Get with it. Gas pedal. Go. Let me get the door for you. Oh, the last donut? No, you take it. I don't need it. Here, you take it. <laughs> Honor. Just little things in life. See, the little things in life add up to the big things in life. The big picture. So who here wants honor? Wow, really? Not a lot of you want honor? Well, who here deserves honor? <laughs> in, first, in First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 12, we read where we get honor. It says, both riches and honor come from you. That's God. And you reign over all. Your hand is power and might. Your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. To all. You want honor? Well, God's got honor. God's got all the honor we could ever want. He's got enough to hand out to everybody. It's just not a little honor for you. Oh, oh, sorry, none for you. No, you don't deserve any either. Well, here, you deserve some honor. I only have so much to go around, so I got to make sure who gets it. No, he has enough for everyone. Amen. So who's good enough for this honor? 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your fathers would walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. If you want honor, God says here, honor me and I will honor you. God honors those who honor him. And, 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 in, and it is within the human heart. There is that capacity for integrity, for morality, for righteousness. And yet, there are times in a life when trial and temptation comes. Trial and temptation comes. Jesus warned us they would, and they will. We see this in an incredible way in the life of Joseph. Joseph, the man with a coat of many colors, who had a couple dreams and kind of, you know, played it up with his bros. Hey, I got dreams, you ain't got dreams, and guess what? You all bow down before me. <laughs> Try that in your house, ain't going to go over so good, especially if you have 11 older brothers. Actually, 10, because Benjamin was younger. And so they devised a plan, we'll kill him, we'll get rid of him. And they had a change of heart, and they threw him in a pit and sold him into slavery. And after being sold into slavery, he sold to an Egyptian by the name of Potiphar. This is where temptation comes because God is with him. God blesses him to be the head of Potiphar's house. And there is a young, beautiful, lonely wife, the wife of Potiphar. And she tempts him. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. I know that story and you're reading into it. How do we know she was young and beautiful? Because it's a temptation. If she looked like this, it wouldn't be much of a temptation, okay? <laughs> you know, it's not like you're going to go, mm, my wife or her? <laughs> I don't care how lonely you are. It's a temptation. It was a temptation. He was strong. It says that he was strong. He had a great figure and he was good looking. That's what the Bible says. Great body, good looking, and it was a temptation. She's young and beautiful. And she throws him, herself at him, sets it up, gets everybody out of the house, setting it up, you know, and that's, that's, that's the big problem, the big setup. Everyone's out of the house. Nobody's there to see. And when nobody's there to see, 
Oh, that's when stuff happens, huh? Yeah. And what does Joseph say? He says, I will not, I will not, absolutely not bring dishonor to my master or my God. And he gets thrown in jail because of it. I won't do it. See, the person who loves God without hypocrisy hates what's evil. But remember, when the house is empty, doors are locked, you pull down the shade, no one in the church can see. No one sees. No one can see. Uh, let's, let's go on. Let's do what? Uh, what happens? Temptation comes. Oh, you know, my wife's not with me, and, you know, well, you know, she hasn't been paying much attention. No one sees. No one, there's no one in the church here. The person who loves God without hypocrisy hates what is evil. He is that person. They are those persons that honor God with their heart, soul, and mind. And when they hit that situation, they put the brakes on. Stop! This is going to hurt my Lord. Stop! And they remove themselves from that temptation and that situation. It's not enough just to kind of go, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, I'll count to ten and it'll be gone. No, you remove yourself from that situation. You remove yourself. There's a thing that says, Nike, just do it. Just do it and run. Run. Run into the everlasting arms of Jesus Christ. Anyways, back to Romans chapter 12. Look at verse 11. Not lagging in diligence... Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoice in hope, patience in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Here Paul lists groups of activities that by doing, we become examples in the church and outside of the church of his love, God's love, agape love. And it's really interesting because in verse 11, this is what we have a great example of steadfast love and service and service. And the operative words in verses 11 and 12 are diligence, fervent, and steadfastly. And and Paul is telling us to be diligent in serving the Lord. Be diligent in serving the Lord. You know, when you're diligent in serving the Lord, there's a dynamic that happens in your life that, that, you know, you grow leaps and bounds. And, And if you think, well, you know, I haven't really been serving the Lord like I should. We have lots of opportunities for you. Jim's back there, I'm here, there's people here. We'll get you plugged in, we'll get you serving the Lord, and we'll see a community changed with the love of Jesus Christ. So he's telling us, be diligent in serving the Lord. And this is something that not only the world expects, but don't you expect that too? Don't you expect the leaders of this church to be diligent? Don't you expect me to be diligent? I mean, how would it be if I came up to her and said, well, you know, <laughs> God, sorry, took the weekend off. Yeah, yeah. Talk amongst yourselves and we'll go home. <laughs> you go, really? I got dressed up for this? <laughs> you expect us to be diligent. Diligence is something that this world is sorely missing. Remember, you can't be diligent in serving the Lord unless you're fervent in the Spirit. See, diligence, circle that word and write eagerness, earnest, willing, zeal. It's, it's literally the earnest commitment in the discharge of an obligation. It's a discharge of an obligation. In other words, you're diligent about it. And how many times, hey, you know, it's hot today, I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> you know. No, diligent about discharging your obligations. Husbands, discharge your obligations as husbands and fathers. Wives, discharge your obligations as wives and mothers. Christians, discharge your obligation as a Christian. There's a dying world, and all you have to say is, Jesus loves you, get saved. Let the Lord work out the rest. (laughs) It's amazing what happens. It's amazing earnest commitment in the discharge of an obligation. 
Diligence is the spirit that continues on when everybody else stops or quits. Christians aren't supposed to be quitters. We don't quit. You know, when the world is going, no, nah, we're done. We give it one more go, one more try. I, I know of literally 20 Calvary chapels that labored for years and there was no fruit. And John Corson and the likes called up Pastor Chuck, can I come home? And Chuck would say, give it one more go, one more year. And you have fellowships like Applegate and Horizon and all these fellowships that are huge. Bob Coy, which is the largest Calvary Chapel in, in the, the world, and it's one of the five largest churches in the nation, he was four years old and he called up because they were saying, hey, can you come home to Vegas and take over the church? And he was a church of about 100 people. And he said they just weren't getting it. So he called up um, Calvary and said, hi, I'm Bob Coy. And they're all, who are you? And he said, you know, there's this thing going on in, in Vegas. He goes, okay, no problem. We will send a Bible student there to love those sheep that you obviously don't. Goes, what do you mean? What do you mean? Well, you, you want to leave, so leave. Quit. Hang it up. Put in your resignation. There's, there's, we got people that would love to love on those people. And you hang up the phone thinking, no, these are my sheep. I love them. I'm going to tend them. I'm going to take care of them. Christians don't quit. We don't give in. We trust the Lord and we press forward. We press forward. We don't go back. The world gives up. We keep going. Proverbs 12, 27. The lazy man does not roast what he took in hunting, but diligence is man's precious possession. Why doesn't the lazy man roast what he hunts? Because he didn't catch anything. He was too lazy. He goes hungry. He was lazy. And the person always sit around, sitting around looking for a handout will always go hungry. But you contrast that to the diligent man who gets up early and stays late. And, 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 and here it is. He gets the prize. He's diligent. He's diligent. Any fishermen here? Anybody like to go fishing? Come on, get those hands up if you like to go fishing. Yeah, There's a few of you here. I, I used to love fishing when I was a kid. Did you know there's a difference between fishing and catching? <laughs> I would go fishing, and I think in my whole lifetime of fishing, I caught one fish It was like this big. I mean, and it, I mean, it's like the hook was bigger than the fish. I'm thinking, really? A lot of people go fishing. Not a lot of people do much catching. Why? Well, they give up, exactly. And when I was a kid, I loved to go fishing. Uh, I lived in a town at that time called Thousand Oaks. And not far from it is a lake called Lake Sherwood. And we would walk over through Westlake, up the hill, and then we'd be in Lake Sherwood. And Lake Sherwood had these like 20 foot high rock cliffs, and we would go fishing. And you know, most of the time we were, you know, at the, at the lake noonish, and you know, we'd 15 minutes, and then we'd be jumping off the cliffs. Yeah, you know, 10 years old. And so I thought, you know what? I want to do catching. I'm tired of fishing. I'm going catching. So I said, okay, guys, we're all going to get up early. We're going to get up early, and we're going to hit the lake early. And I told my mom, I said, Mom, make sure I'm up and out the door early. We're going catching. I'm bringing home food tonight. We're going to eat my fish. <laughs> of course, the fish you catch in Lake Sherwood, you can't eat, and I didn't know that. But so anyway, so uh, you know, I told my friends, I'll get up a little bit earlier and I'll knock on your windows and we're going early. I mean, we're going early. We're catching. And so my mom woke me up and there we were at the lake about 10.30 a.m. <laughs> Lying in there, casting, pulling, casting. About 11.15, we were up on the cliffs jumping in. <laughs> And so I saw these two kids walking by, and they had one of those things where fish are hanging off of it. And it was like they had like six or seven fish, and they were like this, this big. <laughs> they were. I mean, they were big. And I go, hey, where'd you catch those fish? And they said, same lake as you. <laughs> What'd you use for bait? Same worms as you. What time did you start fishing? 5.30 in the morning. 
When would you stop? We're not. We're going to the shade side of the lake and we're going to catch some more. Oh. I haven't been much of a fisherman since. (laughs) Proverbs 4.23 tells us, Keep your heart with all diligence. Diligence. For out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Let all of your ways be established. Do not turn to the left or the right the right or the left, remove your foot from evil. I I love the new translation, the new living translation of Romans chapter 12, verse 11 and 12. This is how it reads. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in in, in our confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. Why? Because if you're going to serve the Lord, you got to be fervent, and you got to be praying. See that word fervent in verse 11, you can circle it and write next to it, to the boiling point. It's to the boiling point. It's like on fire. You know when a fire is so hot, it's like white? That's what he's talking about here. It's to the boiling. It's boiling over. It's boiling over. And, and, and this is exactly what Jesus was talking about to the church of Laodicea in Revelations when he says, I know your works, that they're neither cold nor hot. I wish... You are cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. In other words, being lukewarm, anything less than diligent fervency will cause the Lord to vomit you. It's a beautiful description of Jesus throwing us up. I don't know when the last time you got sick was, but it's like you looked at it and you went, really? Oh. See, that's what lukewarmness is to the Lord. See, He wants us to be on fire. Lukewarmness turns His stomach. And the Lord is clearly telling us, be on fire. Let your spirit be to the boiling point for the things of God. Be a Jesus freak. Now, don't be a Jesus jerk. And I know you guys have met some of those before in your life. Be a Jesus freak. Be on fire for the things of Christ. Be enthusiastic. Who here has ever been to a Super Bowl party? Anyone here? I've been to a few. Oh my gosh, man, you guys don't like sports, do you? Remember when the Cardinals were in the Super Bowl a couple years back? Did you guys go to one of those, you know, you get togethers and all that? What happened every time there was a positive play for the, for the Cardinals? What happened? Ah, high five! Ah, I mean, people running across the room, chest bouncing. Remember when Larry Fitzgerald caught the pass and scored the touchdown? What happened? People went crazy. They were running in the streets. They were getting honking their horns. Hey, 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 we're going to win the Super Bowl. We're going to win the Super Bowl. That's what he's talking about. That's the enthusiasm he's talking about. Be enthusiastic. Any golfers here? Have you ever had a hole in one? Anyone ever had a hole in one playing golf? I'll bet you were pretty darn excited when that happened, right? Yeah, that's what you're supposed to be for Jesus Christ. Same enthusiasm. Same enthusiasm. But don't fake it and make sure it's balanced. Make sure it's balanced. Let your enthusiasm be balanced. Let it be tempered. Now notice in verse 12 again, he says, Rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Never in the Bible, ever, are we told to rejoice in our circumstances. Never. Not even when they're good. Why? Because those change literally moment from moment. One minute your circumstance is this, and then you know what happens? Five minutes later, oh, it's even worse. (laughs) So you don't rejoice in that, but you rejoice in hope. And where's your hope? Where's your hope? Jesus Christ. The return of the Lord. You place your hope, you rejoice in Christ. Why? Because he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. He, there's no variance with God. So if your hope is in him who doesn't change, then he can change your circumstances. Amen. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul tells us, Rejoice always in the Lord. Always again. Again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. He can change those circumstances. 
Next, in verse 12, Paul tells us to be patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Now, personally, this is something that I struggle with. But isn't it interesting that the Bible tells us to... It's interesting, the Bible says that tribulation builds patience. And here he's saying, you know, be patient in tribulation, but tribulation builds patience. Trials come and patience is built. You know, Peter tells us like this, we, you know, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, he says, As His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, see there's that word diligence, add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, knowledge self-control, self-control perseverance, perseverance godliness, godliness brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness love. And if these things are yours and abound, then you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, it's in the tribulation or it's in the trial that God is trying to teach you something. The, the problem is when the tribulation or the trial comes, what do we normally do? God, why are, you, why are you doing this to me? Instead of saying, Lord, what do you want to teach me here? Has anyone here like literally keep going through the same thing over and over again? It's like literally here we go again. <laughs> it's like every two months, here we go again. It's like a cycle. Well, instead of going, why? Go, What? What, what, what do you want to teach me here? What are you trying to show me? Lord, help me get this lesson so I can move on from this. Yeah, right. I, I'm ready to move on from this, Lord. I know you're trying to teach me something. So he says, verse 13, distribute to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. What God is saying here is, when you know of a need, then you should take care of that need. Personally. See, God is revealing a need to you. And so many times what happens and what I see in the body of Christ is God reveals a need and immediately that person will walk over to me and say, hey, did you know about this? And I'll say, no, I didn't. They say, well, you need to do something about it. Well, God revealed it to you. <laughs> and he did for a reason. He did it for a reason. See, that word distributing, you can circle it and right next to it, it's a Greek word called koinonia. Koinonia. And it means all things in common or the sharing of what one has. It, it, it's, a, it's a very well-known word in the Greek. And it's the same word that's used in Acts 2.44 where we read, Now all who believed were together and they had all things in common. That word common, koinonia, sharing. And so they did, they, what they did is they sold everything that they had and they divided amongst themselves as there was a need. And the principle is God is showing you a person in the body with a need. Instead of, instead of pointing them to you know, a, a food place, a food blank, bank, you know, it's like, oh, you don't have food? Well, there's a food pantry at the church and there's even a better one over here on Main. Well, God is saying, I'm revealing something to you. You go take on a meal. You bring them a meal. You do that. Oh, you don't have clothes for your kids for school? Well, I know that the church may have some old you know, clothes, or there's this place over here where they give away clothes that people didn't want anymore too. No. Well, God is saying, you take them shopping. What? Yes. Why? Because that way you're sharing in their suffering because you're sharing your resources. That's Christ-like. Amen. That's Christ-like. Be given to hospitality. In other words, and I love this word, that word given, right above it, harass. Harass. Harass them to hospitality. You're coming over. I don't care if I got to tie you up. Come on, let's go. You're coming over for lunch. I'll drag you to the back of my car. You're harassing them into hospitality. Well, pastor, I mean, I'd love to have strangers over. I'd, you know, I'd love to be hospitable, but my... My house isn't very clean. And, you know, when I clean it up, I notice it needs to be painted. And then I paint it, and I notice that the carpet needed changing. 
You know, I'll have people over when it's perfect. It's never going to be perfect. Sorry. It'll never be perfect. It won't be perfect. Have them over. Be hospitable. If you wait till everything is perfect in your life, heaven will be on earth before that ever happens. Amen. Let your generosity and your love overcome the laundry on the floor in your house. Harass them to hospitality. And see, these are very practical, rubber-meets-the-road kind of love. And James, the half-brother of Jesus, and you know that James, I mean, his, they heard about this all the time, left and right. It's like, oh, here goes Jesus again. Man! This is what James said in chapter 2, verse 14. What is a prophet, my brother? And if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which they are needed for, or which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Amen. Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. Now, we're saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast, but the grace that saves us compels us to be Christ-like. Yes. We're Christ-like. Yes. Hospitality at the time of the first century church, and, and literally probably up to, I would say, literally the last 50 years, was paramount. If you, if you are from an Eastern culture, if you're from the Mediterranean or anything like that, Hospitality is everything. Everything. My wife, who is Hispanic, she is incredibly hospitable. I mean, incredibly hospitable. It's everything, and it was at this time. It was so much so that people wanted to be hospitable that tax collectors and prostitutes said, Jesus, come over, come on. He went. But see, it meant something to have him over. They, they, they compelled. They harassed him. So our love is to be a pure love, a compassionate love, a perfect love. It should also not only be practical, but it should be a private love. What? Private love? What do you mean private love? I thought we're supposed to share. Maybe a better word is independent. Our love should be independent. Look at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your minds on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Our love should be independent of how people treat us. Well, I don't like that one. Can I cross it out of my Bible? Typically, we love those that love us, right? I mean, there's no one here that is going, well, I love loving people that hit me and hate me. No, we like to meet people and we love them because they love us back and we're friends because they're friendly back. And the thing is, is here's the deal, is because we're a family and because has anyone in a family never been in a fight? You know, husbands and wives, you never have fights, and you never have fights with your kids. There's no such thing. We, no, we never fight. Really? <laughs> well, if we're a family, you know, you're loving on someone, and they're loving on you, and then the next thing you know, that person is a jerk. <laughs> Total jerk. I can't believe they, I, I mean, honey, we're leaving the church. The jerk is going there. <laughs> so much for devotion, right? There's always going to be little squabbles and fights. And what he's saying is, regardless of them acting like a jerk, you love them. You love, they're your family. Love them. Love them. Bless those who act like jerks. They persecute you. See, we always become cold and distant, but God's love, agape love, is independent of how people act and how people treat us. Paul tells us to encourage and not curse. And this means this kind of love is not reciprocated. Just love that is given and you know you're not going to get it back. But it's supernatural love. It's apart from the Holy Spirit. And apart from the Holy Spirit, this love is impossible. 
You can't do it apart from the Holy Spirit. And you know what? Even in the Spirit, even walking in the Spirit, this kind of love is really, 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 really hard. It's really hard. Even in the Spirit, it's really hard. It's hard to do. This is one thing that truly shows who you are in Christ, though. Do you realize that? Being able to love the unlovable, being able to love those that persecute you, that hate you, this really shows who you are in Christ. This really shows Christian maturity. And when you consider Paul is talking to the church, he's talking to the body of Christ, there should be even that much more emphasis on this. Okay, they're lashing out at me. They're acting like a jerk. I'll talk to my wife about it later, and maybe she'll repent. No, I'm just kidding. But the idea is, do you understand... When people are in pain, they cause pain. Yes. 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 Do you understand that? Yes. People who are hurting act like jerks. Yes. They do. And so instead of going, ah! we should say, man, are you okay? Is there anything I can do for you? Right. You're, you're, you're hurting. What do you mean I'm hurting? <laughs> I, know, I know you, man. You're a loving and caring individual. What's going on? What's going on? The love of Christ is greater than this. People in pain cause pain. I had no idea. I, I was in pastoral ministry for about 15 years before I felt the Lord say, start a Calvary Chapel. And I had no, unpopular, no idea how unpopular and uncompromising pastor is. This isn't to get any sympathy, but to live out the Word of God is not very popular this day of age. It's not. To, to basically say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to get in that. I'm not gonna, that's, that's not what the Word of God says. To preach the Word verse by verse today is not very popular. People don't want to be convicted or corrected. People want to go home feeling good. And the thing is, is when conviction comes and correction comes, then the real change makes you feel real good. Amen. Real good. God's love is independent. It's an independent love. And that was the love that Jesus Christ demonstrated on the cross. Jesus Christ wasn't a very popular guy at the end, you know. <laughs> but hanging there, beaten and bloody... Nails in his wrists and in his feet. Crown of thorns crammed into his head. Back ripped open. Wasn't going to die from those wounds. Was going to die for a broken heart. There he is hanging there. And as he's hanging there, people are walking by him, mocking him and cursing at him and spitting upon him. You saved others, save yourself. Come down from the cross. Mocking and cursing him. And what does the love of God do? What does God's love do? What does God's love say? Does he say, out of your own lips, your, yourselves be cursed? No. Does he say, hanging there, Father, send down legions of angels and show them a lesson. No. Hanging there, bleeding, broken, and bloody, being cursed at, being spit upon, the love of God, independent of what's happening and what's taking place, looks down and says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Father, they just don't understand. They can't grasp this. They don't get it. They don't understand I am dying to set them free. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ hanged on that cross, not just to set you free from sin and death, but to set you free from the bondage and from these things that are just waiting down upon you to set you free, that you would walk in this independent agape love. Jesus Christ did the work. Now are you 
willing to receive that work into your life? Are you, are you willing to say, I surrender, I'm going to put away these petty things, I'm going to put this thing away, and I'm going to love with God's independent love. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. I praise you, Lord, because you have a list. You have a list. And Father, we thank you for this list. And as we've looked at this list today, we ask, Lord, that you would just illuminate it into our lives and in our hearts. That, Lord, you would correct, convict, that you would exhort, that you would encourage, that we would be your body. And Father, we ask that you would pour out your love upon this place, that you would pour out your spirit, that we truly would be the example, not just one to another, but the example of Jesus Christ to this dying world. Thank you, Lord, for all you do. You know, before I say amen, as every Sunday, if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you want to be free from death, from sin, if you, if you want to just do over your life, if you want to have the guilt removed, then this is your opportunity right now. You can stand up or you can raise your hand and say, I want Jesus in my life. I want to receive him as my savior. I want to be forgiven and I want to walk with him. And if you would like to live out God's independent love, you need to raise your hand too and say, I need that love. I need that love. God bless you. The Lord sees you. God bless you, ma'am. The Lord sees you. Ma'am, the Lord sees you. Sir, the Lord sees you. Ma'am, the Lord sees you. God bless you, sir. He sees you. Ma'am, the Lord sees you. Ma'am, he sees you over here. On, over here. God bless you. Anyone else, you know, saying, you know what, I'm tired. I, I want to I I surrender all and I want him to do it for me. I want, I want him to live through my life and I want to, the Lord sees you, ma'am, here in the front. God bless you, sir, over here. God bless you, sir, right there. Anyone else? Ma'am, God bless you. Now, I don't want to embarrass, sir. He sees you back there. Ma'am, he sees you too. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for moving. Now, we don't normally do something like this, but what I want you people that raise your hand to do is I want you to stand up right now because when, we're, when we dismiss, you come forward so we can anoint you and we can have the baptism of the Holy Spirit come upon your life and do an incredible work in your life. So if that was you, don't be embarrassed. People are rejoicing in this decision you're making. You stand